director of the Austin Chamber Music Center. Welcome here. I'm so glad that you're here with us with Chamber Connect. Um, it gives us the opportunity to connect with you and show you some really great music, some of the great music that we've done over the years with Austin Chamber Music Center. This is our way of connecting with you in this time when it's so hard to do that. We are still really looking forward to the future. We're planning um, and we've got plans. We have tentative plans. We have A plans. We have B plans. We have C plans. We have a lot of plans to be able to uh, reach out to you and, um, and make music with you for you uh, very soon in the future. Um, I do want to take this opportunity to welcome you to come on um, May 9th. We will be doing a very special Chamber Connect where we will be doing our virtual bash online. Every year we celebrate all the programs of Austin Chamber Music Center and all the difference that we make in young people's lives and uh, the performances that we do. So I want to welcome you to come uh, be here on May 9th at 8 o'clock p.m. where we will be featuring the music of Graham Reynolds and his impact as a composition teacher. Uh, he's been teaching composition with us for over 15 years and so he will be performing and talking. We will be featuring our students and um, and I will also be playing some Rachmaninoff. So um, that will be a live performance uh, with some pre-recorded um, parts of it as well, but we would really, really love to enjoy that with you. Tonight we're really excited to be able to feature Invoke. Invoke is one of our favorite groups to be able to present. They do programs for Austin Chamber Music Center throughout the community uh, throughout the year. And this is a featured program of theirs uh, from last year's festival where they did an original score to the movie Fantastic Planet. Fantastic Planet was an animated film, kind of an indie film from the 70s, and they did this incredible original score to it. And recently they had the opportunity to record that score. And so with us tonight, not in a live performance, but in a kind of behind the scenes uh, performance, Invoke is going to be telling us how they composed the pieces, how they recorded it, and be putting it together with the film. Um, so I hope that you enjoy this evening's performance a lot. Uh, it should be very interactive and should be um, really uh, give you a sneak peek into the lives of composers, performers, and how they put together a fantastic piece of music. Enjoy! Uh, 
hello everyone. Let me make sure everything's up and running here. I'm not sure they can hear y'all yet. And how about now? Some of y'all talk. See if I can get y'all through here. I don't think they can hear you, <laughs> which I'm not exactly sure why, but let's find out. Okay. Let's try. Let's switch this over to here. Um, can y'all hear the other guys? If yes, nod your heads. <laughs> if no, shake your heads and also type no in the chat. <laughs> Thanks y'all for coming. Uh, we are Invoke, and uh, for any of us uh, of you who don't know us, we are a string quartet based out of Austin, Texas, and we're going to be doing a little preview the, uh, and of the album we recorded late last year for Fantastic Planet, which is one of our new albums coming out. And it was also, this is ACMC sponsored stream, so thank you so much, Austin Chamber Music Center, for having us on this one. Uh, we really appreciate you having us do these cool projects like this one uh, that we we did last year. We wrote the score for Fantastic Planet, which is a animated film from the 70s. And uh, tonight we're going to be doing a sneak preview of the album. So uh, we're going to be playing through actually all of the tracks from the album and, you know, fielding your questions, comments, any ideas that you have or uh any thoughts you have on the album. And this is the first time ever in front of public ears. So that ought to be fun. I think what I'm going to do is... Um, um, I am going to play the tr first track. And then while I'm doing that, I'm going to try to figure out what's going on with the sound. So... Um, Thanks, y'all, for being patient, and thank you for coming to the stream. We're going to start it off with this track is called The Chase. It's the opening of the film, and here it is for you now. Thank you. 
Hey y'all, welcome back. Oh wait, maybe it's working. Wait, y'all make noise on Zoom real quick. I'm gonna hang up on Zach. Uh, never mind. Never mind, it's not working. Oh well. <laughs> okay, call me back, Zach. Okay, we're gonna do a. We're gonna do. We're calling the audible here. And Zach's calling me on my phone right now. Oh, hello, Zach. Hello. Let's see. Can y'all hear him through my phone? Say something, Zach. Hello, my name is Zach Masson. Those first three pieces. Can y'all hear him? Let's see. Uh, keep talking, Zach. Let's see. Um, I'm talking. This is the sound of my voice. And mute yourself on Zoom kindly, if you would. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So I know if I'm seeing you, hearing you in real life or on Zoom. Okay. I think that's working. All right. Uh, oh, this is a funny situation. <laughs> so we're having some technical difficulties. So this is Zach. He's right here on my phone. And uh, he's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, that, um, that stream. Or that stream. Sorry, that uh, piece. Oh, my mic's a little low. Okay, let me turn that up. Let me switch over here. And I'll turn that up. Oh, and it's... Oh, yeah, it's doing that. Okay, we'll fix that for next time. But anyway, okay, we'll make this yeah, work. So, so talk a little bit about how that works, Zach. Questions, they, they want to throw them out, just let me know. Um, I, the way we went about composing this um, as a group was that um, when we first decided on Fantastic Planet, we sat down on... Um, I think it was on the couch in Carl and Jeff's living room. Let me just turn this down really quick. One second. And uh, we improvised to the movie for about as long as about an hour, minute, hour and twenty minutes. And we sent that recording around to everybody. And we had to kind of extrapolate um, 
different motives and musical elements from the improvisations. And then we um, divided the movie into equal four parts, and I had the first part. So um, in the album, I'm the first three tracks, and it's kind of depicting the mostly the world of the drog, which are these giant blue humanoids that keep little little humans, actual humans called the ohms, as pets. Um, the first track you heard, which was pretty scary, um, is the introduction of our main character, Ter, who is a ohm, and his mother, who is running through the forest to escape a, a group of um, adolescent drog children who are kind of playing with them like their aunts. And so it's really terrifying. The mother, um, spoiler alert, dies. So I wanted to kind of evoke this kind of um, terrifying um, kind of pulsating rhythm in the cello and also the drug, the aliens. I wanted to bring in a lot more of that, um, like, um, kind of crazy effects that you can do. So Jeff was playing electric cello. Shout out to Awesome Chamber Music Center for loaning us their awesome electric cello, and um, yeah, so that was the that was the first piece. And let's see, any other any questions about that? I'm kind of going through. Cool. No, none yet. And then the second one um, piece you heard, which kind of has this um, ostinato figure in the mandolin, um, actually came from one of the themes that Carl wrote later on in the piece. And when we were first bringing in music to, to read, Carl had a lot of his stuff first. And I thought that melody, um, rhythm, ostinato figure, um, which Carl was using to kind of symbolize, um, like fate slash the, the ohms. Um, I wanted to use that in, um, in part of the scenes where the drag are talking about how the ohms used to be these great, uh, have these great civilizations. So it's kind of like a callback to them. And then, uh, and the final um, track you heard, which was kind of weird, had this weird synth effect. It's a really bizarre scene where um, Terra's caretaker, I think your name's Tia, right? I forget her, her name, um, but she's taking care of him. And by taking care, she's kind of like messing with him, putting makeup on him, um, dressing him up in different clothes, chasing him around with like these weird clouds that can like rain on him and sh strike him with lightning. So it's a pretty, it's not like a scary scene, but it's kind of weird. So I wanted to kind of evoke that weirdness and a little bit of a chase kind of sequence in there too. So let's see. How did we divide the pieces up? Did you did the improv sessions um, say who would do what? Um, that's a really good question, Michelle. And we, the improv was just literally there was no um, there was no discussion prior discussion beforehand. We all brought in um, our instruments and extra instruments. I had I think a lot of glasses that I found around Carl and Jeff's kitchen at the time, and then Carl had his guitar out and a lot of different things were happening. But afterwards, um, we kind of went through and watched the piece together. We listened to the improv and we kind of delineated sections that we thought would be appropriate to, for each member to, kind of, or for us to split up. So there's kind of four natural sections of the whole movie. And yeah, we just went, we just went from there just, um, Whoever was feeling it in that moment, we kind of just were like, who wants to first and raised our hands and took it that way. Let's see. Any other questions? Oh, nice. The major thirds over the minor ostinato. Yeah. That's a cool, like the, um, I really, I, I really like hearing what Carl had. It was kind of fun to be already like halfway through the process and I was kind of stumped on one section. And so Carl having that was a way for me to tie in my music to what would happen later and kind of give some like, you know, motivic elements to uh, 
piece, which could have sounded really random, but I think by kind of working together in that way, we were able to have some threads throughout the entire entire piece. Let's see. Yeah, Carl's mandolin sections are just hands up. <laughs> hands up indeed. Um, so Carl, actually, the um, second piece that you heard right there was my, from my section. So yeah, you wrote the Austin Auto figure, but I actually um, switched. I, I, I That was my composition part that I got there. Nice. Just fielding multiple questions from multiple places. There's a, Zach, can you hear me? Yeah. There's a question about the uh, glasses. Are there glasses in the recorded score? Oh, yes. So, in, um, I think it's your section, Nick, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and also in, I think you heard them a little bit. They heard some tinklings in the last uh, piece that you just heard. So they'll be upcoming, and you'll you'll hear them tinkling every once in a while. And then in Nick's piece specifically, we can talk more about it there. Um, it's uh, it's pretty obvious where they come in. It's pretty 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 interesting. And uh, Nick can talk about what he did to make that those sounds so strange. So should we um, move on a little bit? Yeah, let's let's do it. All right. Uh, I will hang up the phone now and then play some more tunes.
Alrighty then, so I think we're going to get Jeff on the phone now, and he's going to talk about this last, this next section. Anyway, now let's see how we're doing. You already heard that. Okay. Let's call Jeff. Get him in the action here. Oh, he's trying to call me while I'm trying to call him at the same time. There we go. All right. 
Jeff, can you hear me talking? All right. Yeah. Nice. Man. Technology is not cooperating with me either. Um, <laughs> normally, I'd be using my phone for this kind of thing, but I'm using my phone as a webcam. So, can y'all, hopefully this is working. I guess if Nick can hear me, then y'all can hear me. Seems to be going well on my end, so have at it. All right. Let's do it. Um, let's see. Can I go ahead and open this up at the same time? That would be glorious. So this, the part that I took on was a bit of a transitionary period in the film. Um, but there was some cool stuff that I pulled from the improvs that we did at the very beginning of the whole process. And the first part with the kind of sprinkles of um, banjo strums and a little bit of uh, glass tinklings, uh, that's all kind of background that we just happened upon um, in the improv for a part of the film where we're kind of realizing how the drugs, the blue aliens gain knowledge. Um, they have this kind of headband thing that lights up and they learn things about the world and history. Um, and that's kind of, that's important the later on because that we did the, at the very humans, beginning. The ohms get a hold of one of those devices and they get smarter later because they learn all this crucial information that um, the intelligent drug race had been successfully educating their children with. Um, but there's this interesting uh, kind of back and forth between a B flat fifth and a um, second inversion B to G, so G chord um, in the in the low cello part that kind of comes back and forth, always back to that B flat fifth chord though, um, with all this improvised kind of going in and around that in uh, swells. Um, and yeah, it was, it's kind of then evolves into a, a bit of a slow jam with the mandolin keeping the um, keeping the, the groove, um, which kind of reminded me uh, of a little bit of a folk tune. Um, it's kind of relationship building in the film. Um, moving forward, there's some stuff from the actual soundtrack that we skipped over, so I need to click through it here. Ah, oh yeah. The um, I don't have the track list in front of me. I have so many screens in front of me right now, so I'm getting a little bit uh, overstimulated, and I can't remember all the tracks. Um, but the the part with the, uh, with the viola playing kind of a slowly ominous line uh, with me and me playing some bits kind of turns into a fiddle tune ish with uh, in Nick's part uh, on violin and. That was another bit from the from the uh, jam. It was really cool to happen upon that. It's cool to happen upon that when you're when you're improvising. And I was able to roughly transcribe it uh, with all of Nick's characteristic uh, ornamentation. Um, and of course, that changed every time, and that was part of the fun of playing this. Um, but again, there's that split third motif um, where sometimes it's in G major, sometimes it's in G minor um ish at least very modal of course uh and and getting that getting that right with, while there's the jam moving on um and then if the synth comes in very low uh with the same motive from the very beginning of the film that zach used um and how do i describe this in english with a flat two and then a flat three minor third and then the tonic back and forth um, and in the recording we took all of the rest of the pitches out and just kind of made it a percussive uh, little bit of a jam before fading out um, and then we followed with something I remember distinctly with kind of an arpeggiated uh, bass line synth bass um, and I remember just kind of improvising in my head on an airplane I don't remember exactly where we were coming, where we were going, coming from, but I just decided to like see what would happen. Um, I just worked over this pedal G uh, with a lot of agitation because of the arpeggiation in uh, the synthesizer um, with a couple of pits chords and just things to agitate things a little bit. Um, that is 
that scene is important because the domesticated ohm, the human, um, is escaping from his drag kind of captors um, with one of these knowledge headbands. So it's pretty tense, and we don't exactly know what's going to happen. The ohm is exper uh, coming across all this alien foliage, uh, and he's not really sure where he is or where he's going, uh, but he knows that he needs to get out. And then it modulates into a cool from 12.16 to 4.4 uh, when the percussion comes in. And strings come in, and it's just really dissonant um, because there's still like this neck band around the ohm, kind of a collar, which the drags or the drags control with this little uh, joystick thing. So that basically, they yank him back until he's caught in some in some brush and another wild ohm comes and cuts him free and saves him and that's when that's when the synthesizer dissipates and all the tension goes um so it was really interesting to kind of try to fill the time in the film with um you know figuring out what little interjections are necessary um and when the moods shift from kind of nervousness to actual dread uh, and everywhere in between. So yeah, any questions? Let me start looking at the things, all the different streams. Uh, Jeff, there was a question about working with the young artists. Maybe talk, speak to that ah, a little bit. Yeah, so we had a lot of fun um, these past two films that we've done with the Austin Chamber Music Center. Um, Fantastic Planet last summer and the Adventures of Prince Ahmed um, in 18. To, and we got the chance to work with some of their young artists from the academy portion of the festival. Um, so mostly high school age um, instrumentalists. And we gathered a, a not a small, but not very large cohort, kind of a chamber orchestra, um, a handful of violins and violas and cellos. Um, and some keyboard players um and we just kind of like let our imaginations run wild with being able to orchestrate our music which is on the one hand very fun because you have a lot more colors you can play with um a lot more people that can be doing different things at one time but on the other hand very intimidating because um not only is it kind of difficult to write some of our crazy ideas down <laughs> whereas i can talk to zach and tell him to like do the thing that he does and he can at least try to you know interpret what i'm saying but being able to put things onto a page in a way that we're able to rehearse this whole film score up in a week um is certainly a challenge but every every one of those kids really rose to the occasion and they uh, came at rehearsals every day with enthusiasm and really made us um super excited to be working with them and all in all we're very happy to have had that chance um and we've been seeing them you know since the performance because they're local um and we've seen them around town and say hey it's good to see you again and maybe they come to our concerts or we see them perform and it's it's always nice to um kind of be further integrated into the awesome austin music community All right, I need to look at more comments. Movable Feast poster, haha, <laughs> yes. That has two purposes. One, to be weird because it's like my face is there, 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 and here. And uh, also there's a pile of music there that, that y'all don't need to be seeing. Um, <laughs> it's rather unsightly, but that was a fun show. Again, Austin Chamber Music Center. In case you didn't know where um, we love them and we, get a chance to, we jump at every chance we can to collaborate. Shall we Thank hop you. into some more tunes? Sure. How many instrumentalists first? Um, how many was it? I think the first year was maybe 13 or so, 13 to 15 each year, I would say. I'm walking Phrygian. All right. I think I'm going to sign off here. 
All righty. Thanks, y'all. This is your host again. I guess I'm your host now. The next few are, uh, let's see. So just a brief rundown of what's going on. There, the Ohm's escape, or the our our protagonist escapes from his drag captors, and uh, he travels through the wilderness essentially and finds some wild ohms. So that's what's going to be happening in these next few tunes.
Alrighty then, and there you have it. Three more tracks from Fantastic Planet. We're going to get Carl on the line this time. Carl wrote those last couple of tunes. And uh, let's see if we can get him uh, hooked up here. There he comes. Hello, Carl, and welcome to the stream. Well, hello, Nick. Hello, stream. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Let me get your picture up here. Nobody wants to see my face anymore. All right, there you go. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, so Nick might want to correct me on these track names. We were still sort of finalizing some of those, but I think the first one you heard was called Journey. Um, yes. And the, that one's the one Nick described. Nick, was that correct? It's Journey, right? Did I get it right? Yeah, yeah. We've, Perfecto. The titles have gone through a couple iterations, so... <laughs> Yeah, as they want to do. It's funny, a soft premiere, it is quite soft because it's like um, we have the art and we have the titles, but it's sort of like, you know, all this caught a lot of things unexpectedly, including your album releases. So, <laughs> um, yeah, Journey's pretty cool. Uh, that one, I think, actually is when uh, the ohms, the wild ohms that Tear finds himself with, they take off to go to. Uh, uh, get bring some supplies, I think, or something like that. And they just, they travel through all these various landscapes. And it's sort of a theme that keeps coming up in this movie. It's super visually awesome. There's all these strange alien landscapes. And there's kind of two travel tracks that occur. Um, uh, and there's another one later that's a little similar. The next track was Nighttime Rituals. That one, uh, that's one I wrote. Oh, sorry, uh, Journey was one that Jeff put together. Nighttime Rituals, I wrote... Um, and it's uh, this really awesome scene where sort of the shaman chief of the uh, of the wild ohms gathers all of the adult ohms into like a, this field on this old skull. You saw the skull in the imagery. That's one of the drugs. It's one of the alien skulls. Um, and for whatever reason, it's there. And uh, they perform this sort of like rite. And basically all of the uh, all of the ohms leave and um we're assuming make babies <laughs> but it was kind of an interesting scene to tackle because it's kind of silly but also very sacred at the same time um and i wanted people to sort of feel like they were getting lost in the scene so i ended up with going with this sort of max richter philip glass-esque kind of minimalist style um but yeah it, it's uh it's it was a fun one to write uh, and definitely it was a really cool one to include the students in because we really got this big orchestra sound and, and Jeff, I don't know if you mentioned, but there was like seven cellists or something crazy, maybe not seven, but compared to the other instruments, there's a lot of cello. So I was able to just stack this low kind of booming sound underneath this sort of motor. It's like do, 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 and all this stuff. Um, yeah. Got to fight for your rights. <laughs> yeah. It's super cool. It's actually one of my favorite scenes. We laughed the first time because it's just, it's so, so strange, but the more you watch it, the more it just sort of sinks in. It's, it's this very sacred thing in the movie itself. Now, the next scene is a little silly. The next scene was funny because it, uh, so Tear confronts the chief about using the knowledge, uh, the knowledge bracelet that he steals from the drag, that big circular thing he's running around with. Uh, the chief thinks that all that knowledge is evil and that they shouldn't touch it. And Tear says, oh no, I guess it's the shaman. There's two different people, the shaman and the chief. And the shaman doesn't like it. So the shaman challenges Tear to fight via combat animals. And that's what you see strapped to them in the, in the images, these big crocodile things with blue jaws. Strap them onto each other and they fight basically to the death. And, and Tear somehow pulls out this victory. And the original, uh, and then they were able to keep this knowledge bracelet to learn from the drag ways, which is what Tara wants them to do. Um, the original track uh, was a little bit longer, and it, or I guess it was a little bit shorter, actually. And there was sort of this rising chromatic crescendo that happens as the theme goes on, this kind of fiddle-like theme, kind of, as Zach mentioned, keeping the theme of the ohm music being more acoustic and then the drag music being more electronic. Um, but during the recording process, we just were having way, way too much fun with the theme itself. And we decided to sort of throw kind of a bluegrass structure on it. So you can hear there's kind of an A, B, A, B, then some solos, and then back. Uh, so that's not actually how we ended up doing it in the film. But it turned out it turned out sounding pretty cool. 
I thought they were dancing. So yeah, no, they weren't. They weren't dancing. They were. <laughs> I was uh, compiling screenshots to use for this, and there is one of Tara's opponent kind of lying in a pool of his own blood, <laughs> and I chose not to include that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's pretty brutal. I mean, the movie is very savage. I, I think the uh, the actual it's it's a French film, and the actual name is Savage Planet. I think. Uh, uh, Planet Savage or something like that. I mean, I'm butchering that. I don't speak French, but uh, kind of the whole movie is very savage. It is so fantastic. It's funny because it is fantastical, but there's also this sort of like primal brutality that kind of runs through the whole thing. Let's see here. Oh, wow. So many, so many comments. Nick, do, do you see any here that I should address? Let's see here. Oh, here we go. What's harder for y'all rehearsing with the students for this in a week or learning and performing the 16 compositions for string quartet smackdown? It's different work. It's definitely different. Um, this is this sort of film music is fulfilling in, in a different way, just simply because we're the we're involved in the creative process and beyond, you know, obviously when we're rehearsing and performing new works like for the smackdown, we are involved as far as like the interpretation and there's a little bit of like boots on the ground work that goes on. But when, when we are totally uh, in charge of creating the music, that's its own thrill for sure. Uh, and for those of you that aren't familiar, that String Quartet Smackdown is uh, another awesome concert that happens here in Austin, Texas, run by an organization called Golden Hornet. And it's where we learn 16 different new music compositions of four minute length that go head to head on an NCAA style bracketed competition live at the Alamo Draft House, which is a movie theater in town, um, a chain in town. Uh, we do that every year as well. So honestly, SmackDown, it's funny that Peter uh, br brings this up at the SmackDown and then the uh, film for the ACM's Austin Chamber Music Center Festival are kind of our two big highlights here in Austin for concerts. The Wild Arms. Cool. Well, I don't know. Does anyone else have any questions about any of that? We can just keep cruising here. Yeah. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we get another? Let's do it. In, once more into the breach, as they say. Once more. All right. Thanks, Carl, for your expertise. And now we're going to jump into a few more. Let me see what we're looking at here. Uh, so we just did combat animals. Now we're going to do new clothes, which is also kind of a goofy one. And then further infos. And then the anteater attack. All right. So these are more adventures with the wild ohms. Here we go.
Alrighty then. That was, we actually added another one, the hollow bush gang warning onto the end of that one. We're getting Carl back on the, on the horn here to talk a little bit about those tunes. Welcome back, Carl. Hello. Let me show him the old face. There you go. I'm going to talk some more. <laughs> What's up, everyone? It. Cool. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I was, well, this is also within my section, my quarter of the piece. Uh, the first track you heard was called New Clothes. And if you can see in the imagery, sort of terror goes out into the wilderness and these tiny little glob creatures surround him and then literally build him out of natural materials, this sort of clothing that the wild ohms wear. It's kind of a neat scene because it sort of builds a lot of the, uh, it gives you a sense of the atmosphere of the wild ohms and just how they rely on nature and all this stuff. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Jeff on that one, actually. The cool, cool thing about getting to compose and and collaboratively like improv together is that often you can just sort of like, I could just like say to Jeff, hey, so I had a few, I had an idea for uh, sort of like kind of a loose swingy solo over this. Could you do that? And he'd be like, sure. So that the mandolin riff was the first thing that, and the only thing that's really written down for that part. Everything else that's happening is improv and props to Jeff on an awesome little solo over top of that track. It really pulls it together. And also I wanted to shout out Zach and Jeff in the Combat Animals one. The solos in that were both just totally improv. We did like, I think two takes and they both, both takes were awesome. And we just took, uh, I don't even remember which ones we took, but <laughs> the ones we got were pretty cool. Um, yeah, the next track after that, uh, it's, it's entitled Further Infos and then Kiss. And basically it's, you could see the ohms, the wild ohms are starting to take in this, uh, take in this knowledge that the drags have been had for so long. And they're starting to learn about uh, the universe around them, basically. Um, and how, how, uh, how things work, basically science, engineering, all these things. Uh, and so I wanted to use that fate theme that was introduced at the beginning that Zach was talking about, the little mandolin riff. But I took it and I put it in the synthesizer because what, it, what I think that does is shows that this idea that um, the fate is sort of entwined around tear and the, and the ohms and this sort of more acoustic thing. Now, because the, you know they have this drag technology, fate is now in their hands, this sort of like the themes that Zach was using with the synthesizer and the electronic sounds, that's now synergized. And now it's like, yeah, the fate could be harnessing the drags like technology, harnessing their knowledge and doing something different. And then right at the end of that scene, Tear and um, and his love interest, this this uh, ohm, ohm girl that saves him, they share this kind of tender moment where she expresses to him that she's worried about all the knowledge and admires him for all his knowledge. And then he's like, well, you could have it too. And she's like, oh, I can barely write. And then they have a kiss and it's very cinematic. So <laughs> kind of fades out to the banjo and the mandolin playing that there. Uh, the next scene uh, is is from a, a bigger scene that we had to we didn't record a lot of for the album just because it, it went on for a bit and most of it's visual. But there's this remarkable scene where the Ohms fight a giant flying anteater, and you can see it in the imagery that Nick put up. You can see the skeleton of it. And what happens at the end of the fight is the the movie does this awesome thing where it shows is the corpse of the anteater after the Ohms slay it, and then it shows the passing of time as the body, its body decays into bones and like nature reclaims the land around it. Um, so there's sort of this like cello arpeggio, that, do, da, da, de, da, da, do, that whole arpeggio that goes up and down is just sort of like very uh, Messia quartet for the end of time, sort of just let's just move through time, watch as this giant alien anteater decomposes before your eyes on screen. <laughs> Uh, and it's an awesome, awesome world building scene because you really get a sense for the scope of the movie. Um, but anyway, that's just the end of that scene. And we decided to extend it a bit. Nick put some piano on top of it that may or may not have made it through in the stream just now. I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, it, it didn't. It was that's, broken. That's a bummer because <laughs> Nick played a pretty nice piano for that track. But um, Cool. So then the very last track, and I'll wrap this up quick, it was, uh, it's called Hollow Bush Gang Warning. Hollow Bush Gang is another, they're another crew, another Ohm crew that lives like down the way. They live literally in a hollow bush. So they're known as the Hollow Bush Gang to the wild Ohms that Tara is friends with.
Now, they've received information that the drag are going to come in and do what's called de-oming, which is basically pest control, and clear out the wild, the hollow bush gang. Terror, Terror's not about that, um, and the, the chief doesn't care, and the wild ohms that he's with don't care because they're rivals, but Terror has bigger has a bigger vision for the ohms future, and he wants to sort of unite them all. So he runs off in the middle of the night, gets his way over there, and you can hear the music's kind of tense in that moment. Um, and it kind of uh, just crescendos because this is really the end of the third quarter of the film, the kicker into like the really big conflict when the drag really start cracking down on the ohms and their, uh, their steely, knowledgeable ways. Uh, yeah, and I think, uh, I think that's where I'll leave it off. Nick, Nick handled the rest of it from here very aptly. And uh, this, was, this has been fun. Thanks, y'all. Uh, Thanks, Carl. Yeah. All right. So we've got a few, uh, let's see how many more we got, actually. Uh, looks like we have, about, yeah, about eight more. So let's do a set of four. So this will be, uh, as Carl was mentioning, this is the part of the film where um, the ohms have, the wild ohms have found their way, uh, like, out into their... Um, or our, the tear, our protagonist, has found his way to the wild ohms. And the wild ohms have just gotten word that there is to be a de-oming. Uh, so that's the track you'll hear next. Uh, that, that's basically the, the big uh, terrifying battle scene. Um, and then the, you know, the ohms have to find a new place to live. So that's this whole new sequence is them uh, being attacked and then having to find a new place to uh to live afterwards
All right, so that was sort of the transitional period between um, the deoming, which does happen. Many ohms die in the process, uh, and then they find their way to the shipyards, which you saw a couple of um, photos of those. Those are these are ancient, uh, basically defunct drog shipyards that the ohms then. Uh, discover through the knowledge device that uh, semicircular thing with the kind of uh, little spheres on it. Uh, they discover through that process how to actually harness that technology for their own selves. So they use the um, they use the ohm technology to build themselves spaceships, and uh, we'll see where they go in the next episode. But let me see if there's any questions real quick, and then I'll talk a little bit about the compositional process of that. So um, the a lot of these sections uh, were taken directly, or the, the basic material was taken directly from our jam over the whole film that we recorded. Um, and then I basically looped little segments of those and uh, built grooves out of those. So you might have heard that a lot of that material was sort of loopy groovy type stuff um, and that came directly from the jam some of it was just directly uh, transcribed and then looped uh, sections um, the drog business theme is actually there's a couple of scenes in the film where the drogs have these big meetings uh, they're like council meetings and uh, the drog business theme comes back at each one of those uh, this meeting that they just had was the um, during the deoming actually there's a fight and uh, one of the drugs is killed by the ohms they they take him down kind of like uh, Gulliver's travel style like uh, it takes a bunch of them to take him down but they actually do manage to kill one of the drugs which is you know a big uh, uproar in the in the drug council of course and um, and so they have a big meeting to figure out what to do about uh, the ohms and uh, let's see I'm just glancing at these to see if I'm missing anything yeah and actually de -ohm, with the exception of de-ohming uh, the next three that you heard so um, the first one that you heard is you know has a bunch of synths and other stuff in it the other three I'm actually looking at the recordings were just uh, one basically one take straight through of just a jam on that material and that's how we came up with a lot of the album versions you know for the movie we had to fit it to the uh to the actual film and make sure it timed out right and everything but for the album you know like some of the guys mentioned we, we the process was a lot more free so we were able to you know use the material for as long as we want loop it for as long as we wanted to um and you know explore the material that's 
that's part of the reason why a lot of these tracks came out um, being kind of on the shorter side is because we would just take a little uh, grain of the material and often not arrange it for the album or just very loosely arrange it and then just jam for a while until it felt like it was enough. And, you know, I, I thought it was really interesting that a lot of those jams came out to, you know, around two minutes or so. Uh, you know, we would take just a very short, sometimes just one or two bars of material and generate about a two minute uh, track out of that. And those last three were some examples of that. Um, let's see. Any questions? So now what, what happens in the rest of the film is that the um, ohms... You know, they figure out ways basically to build their own spaceships and uh, they they find they find out how to use the drag technology to build smaller spaceships, but with the same uh, resources so that they can basically escape from the uh, the planet that they're on in advance of the the drugs coming coming back to do a, a second deoming, which actually we there's not an album cue for this. But in the film, after this big council meeting, they actually decide, you know, we got to take this seriously. And they go back out into the wild. And, uh, you know, there's a there's a huge battle again. Um, but at this point, a lot of the ohms have found their way to the um, to the shipyards where they're building these ships to get off planet. And at the same time that the you know, a lot of the drugs are getting, you know, or a lot of the ohms rather are getting um uh, basically killed off by the drugs. Uh, there's this select group that has the knowledge of the drug machinery and technology that is escaping to another world. And we'll see that world shortly as we get towards the end of the film here.
All right, so that those were almost the end of the the film, and just to give you a little idea of what's happening there, so they they find these ships, they escape the second deoming, they blast off to the moon of the planet that they're living on, and you know over the course of the film, the drogs have been engaging in these meditation experiences where they're kind of transfigured, transformed, and they're uh, basically their brains are transported to another place and we're not really sure where they're going. Uh, but then at the end of all of this, they find their way to the moon and they actually discover that on the moon is where the drugs go to meditate. It's where they send like their spirits or their brains or whatever you want to call them uh, to, um, to meditate. And that's basically how they have their, they found their life force. So, uh, and those, that's the dancing part. So the, the most, the last track that we just saw, you saw that image of the, those tall figures dancing. Those are basically the drogs, uh, spirits that are dancing. And that's how they, um, uh, basically how they re how they procreate. <laughs> so, um, so the ohms discover this and, uh, they attack these, uh, spirits and, um, and destroy a lot of them. And it, basically, in the process, they corner the drogs, you might say, like militarily, <laughs> uh, into negotiating peace. So at the very end, they, uh, you know, they finally come together to say, you know, let's stop, stop all of the, the warring and the fighting. Um, you know, we understand that we can live together peacefully. Uh, and they do. Uh, and, and all of this happens in the last like five to 10 min minutes of the movie, which is a very intense turnaround at the end. But um, so we'll play one more track. And then the this track is what happens right after that peace process, basically to play out the credits of the film. Uh, and then right after that, I'll bring the guys back on to answer any questions and we'll uh, we'll wrap it up for the night. So. The last track you're going to hear for tonight is called Final Peace.
All right, and there you have it. The entirety of Fantastic Planet, the album. For the first time ever in front of public ears. Let's see. Oh, Carl, are you on the phone over here? Let me see. I think that might, might be Carl. I'm calling Carl. Uh, there we go. All right, let's get the guys in here. All right, is everybody here? Yes, sir. All righty. Yep. Oh, and I can switch to this. Oh, this worked great. All right. <laughs> oh, the workaround. Never better. Oh, boy. Did we get it? Okay. It's working. Cool. It's all working. Yes. Um, well, thank you all for coming. Hey. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. And thanks to Austin Chamber Music Center for hosting this stream. Uh, it's really fun for us to get to, you know, kind of give you a sneak preview of our upcoming releases. Let's see if there's any questions here. We did have some more questions about uh, uh, probably the moon track. Um, and Zach addressed it a little bit in the comments. Yeah, Nick, do you have that? Um, do you have the the glass contraption that I made? Glass I do, contraption. as a matter of fact. Well, yeah, we can mm -hmm. do a little bit of show and tell, actually. Yeah, I think that uh, that would be a cool thing to show. I There's, like, some delay in what I'm seeing, so I can't really explain it very well. But I will say that it spins, and when you spin it and it's full of water while you're blowing it, it can, like, wobble and make a crazy vibrato sound effect, so too. Let me see if I can hold this up to where people can see what's happening. Uh, so yeah, y'all could probably see this. So this is basically a old rusty stool <laughs> with four water glasses on it. I'm actually, I'm going to switch back to just my screen for a second. So it's an old stool with water glasses on it and, uh, it's pretty dusty right now, but, um, actually I have some water right here and let's see if I can also reach a bow. So, you know, you can blow water glass, glasses normally. You get that glorious sound, and you can also hit them. Uh, but one of the effects that we used, I can't do it by myself, unfortunately, <laughs> and also hold this up to where everybody can see it. But we actually poured, or Zach, Zach played this, so Zach poured water into the um, glasses as he was playing, which changes the pitch while you're, uh, while you're bowing it. Which is pretty cool but i'll just demonstrate so you whoops well first i'll drop my stuff everywhere and then, <laughs> oh my gosh so you can bow a glass like that and you can see if i pour some water in here then the pitch will be different and you can like shake the water around to get weird effects like that so zach was the zach was the uh the glasses maestro. The water bender. The water bender. <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> and I'll show you a couple other things. I'm going to show them the eagle and the electric cello too. Yeah. Yeah. The the cello part. Did we do that in one take? Did I? Did you just like plug me in with the cello and basically just say, "Okay, have fun for two minutes," and then I did, and that's what came out. And we yes. Just kept it? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm showing everybody's screen again now. Je Jeff, do you want to talk a little bit about... So, a Austin Chamber Music Center loaned us this electric cello. And, Jeff, do you want to talk a little bit about your process of, like, playing this and that recording? You're talking about Moon, right? Yeah. Yeah. Specifically, the very, very, uh, has commented, very performance-intensive um, track. It's a, it's a cool... Well, okay, so the electric cello is basically the same thing as an acoustic cello, except it has a pickup and no sounding box. Um, took a little bit of learning to play just to get it kind of getting used to the different physicality of it. It's just very slightly different to be able to um, be comfortable playing notes um, that I, you know, I've been playing on an acoustic cello for, for years. Um, but that was pretty quick. Uh, but what was cool about it was that it fed directly into the computer basically to create 
whatever we wanted. We could use the information that the cello was was giving uh, Reaper, because the program we're using to process all the sound, um, and we could use Reaper to to do whatever we wanted with that with the pitch material. Um, so there were a heck of a lot of things. I mean, Nick can speak to the specifics, but there were a lot of filters, a lot of distortion, some uh, arpeggiated, slightly randomized effects, like multiple octaves and different, uh, multiple octaves up. And um, so a lot of the sound in, in that track is actually only the cello playing. Um, and it actually <laughs> was increasingly cool because it, I was uh, using left hand pits sometimes at the same time as Boeing. So it sounded like even more things going on at the same time when it was all just me and the computer, which was a really cool thing to mess around with uh, when you've got all this other stuff um, kind of responding to what you just did a second ago and splurting out all these crazy uh, arpeggiations, multiple octaves up and and tons of reverb and, and uh, sometimes even undertones when you play certain fifths usually it, uh, because of the, the sample rate it tends to sound like an octave below which is really cool and I like low notes um, I couldn't make the effects with the glasses obviously but I thought that it was really cool that basically that entire track the only remotely traditional instrument being used was that electric cello everything else was effectsy yeah it's really cool um and one last show and tell thing so you might have heard a couple of times there was a kind of crazy synth sounding um thing that sounded kind of scratchy and or droney that was this instrument which is called an eagle it's from tuva which is kind of near Mongolia. And it's a horse head fiddle. So you can see it's got the, got the head of a horse and it's got two strings made out of horse hair and it's a folk fiddle. So you'd normally play it like on your leg, kind of like a gamba and it's terribly out of tune. <laughs> oh. Last time I played it was probably to record this stuff. So, but you get the idea. And, you know, I used a lot of extended techniques on this, like, uh, extreme Ponticello on the bridge. And we also put a pickup on this and put tons and tons of effects on it because I don't know how to play this thing. So uh, the more effects on it you have, the less you actually need to play to have it sound good. So <laughs> that's what we did and uh, it worked out great. So um, yeah, that's kind of the, the background be behind some of the, some of the sounds on that album. See, do anybody have any questions about any of that or playing this electric cellos? Yeah. Oh, shout out to Andy Deskins. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that. That was that was super awesome. It was, you know, it was a integral part. It, as we built this album, it was really interesting to see what sounds kind of came out of the fray. <laughs> to be the most prominent ones and the eagle and the electric cello and the, um, the synthesizers and you know all that stuff really rose I think to the top because of how strange the film was and how spacey and you know out there the film was we <laughs> we were able to use those effectively and let's let's uh, let's pour one out for those we lost along the way including the guitar the Quaker oatmeal container with yeah. a little bit of oats oh, yeah. in it. We did have a Quaker. We had what a else, shaker. What else that didn't was, make it? Um, I forget I, what else. Yeah. That might have been all that didn't make it. We really. Yeah, we, we tried. There was a lot. There was a lot in this one. All right. Well, uh, shall we call it an evening? I think that sounds good to me. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Yeah, Thank thanks you. again for coming, and thanks to ACMC for uh, hosting the stream. And we'll see oh. y'all. Go ahead. Nope. Should we just stay tuned for plans on when we're actually going to release the album? You'll be hearing shortly about that. Yeah.
this is obviously the soft premiere. I'm not, uh, and, but we do have plans on um, making a an LP, an actual vinyl record for you guys to have. We got an amazing artist, Maya Winter, who made some incredible art. Obviously, we couldn't use the art from the film, but she really captured the spirit of the of the music and what its origins were. So we're really excited to release that. So stay tuned for updates on how you can be a part of that because you'll, you'll, you'll definitely want to do that. For sure. And I think we will be doing another stream, right? Next Friday. Is mm -hmm. that true? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. We're, we're, we're trying to do this every, basically every, uh, um, Friday night, at least solo streams until, uh, you know, until we can be in the same room safely again, and then we'll start to do group streams. So stay tuned for those. Oh, can we ever see the film with the music? Uh, yes, we're, we're hoping to play it live at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Again, live again. We, we, we've gotten to play it, uh, for Austin Human Music Center's festival, Summer Festival. And we did get to play it also at Interlochen uh, at the Adult Chamber Music Festival that we're faculty at. So there's been two performances live and we want to, we want to do more, but then this pesky COVID thing happened. Pesky yeah. COVID. That's not conducive for movie theaters. <laughs> no. Yeah, so Chamber, yeah, I'm just seeing from uh, ACMC, next Chamber Connect is next Saturday, I believe at the same time. So check that out as well. And we will see y'all later. Thanks for coming. Good night. Good, Good night. night.